The Shallows by Nicholas Carr Chapter 9 Search Memory Socrates was right. As people grew accustomed to writing down their thoughts and reading the thoughts others had written down, they became less dependent on the contents of their own memory. What once had to be stored in the head could instead be stored on tablets and scrolls or between the covers of codices. People began, as the great orator had predicted, to call things to mind not from within themselves, but by means of external marks. The reliance on personal memory diminished further with the spread of the letterpress and the attendant expansion of publishing and literacy. Literacy. <laughs> Literacy. Thank you. Books and journals at hand in libraries or on the shelves of private homes became supplements to the brain's biological storehouse. People didn't have to memorize everything anymore. They could look it up. But that wasn't the whole story. The proliferation of printed pages had another effect, which Socrates didn't foresee, but may have well welcomed. Books provided people with a far greater and more diverse supply of facts, opinions, ideas, and stories than had been available before, and both the method and the culture of deep reading encouraged the commitment of printed information to memory. In the 7th century, Isidore, the Bishop of Seville, remarked how reading the sayings of thinkers in books rendered their escape from memory less easy. Because every person was free to chart his own course of reading, to define his own syllabus, individual memory became less of a socially determined construct and more the foundation of a distinctive perspective and personality. Inspired by the book, people began to see themselves as the authors of their own memories. Shakespeare has Hamlet call his memory the book and volume of my brain. In worrying that writing would enfeeble memory, Socrates was, as the Italian novelist and scholar Umberto Eco says, expressing an eternal fear, the fear that a new technological achievement could abolish or destroy something that we consider precious, fruitful, something that presents for us a value in itself, and a deeply spiritual one. The fear in this case turned out to be misplaced. Books provide a supplement to memory. But they also, as Ecco puts it, challenge and improve memory. They do not narcotize it. The Dutch humanist Desiderius Erasmus, in his 1512 textbook De Copia, stressed the connection between memory and reading. He urged students to annotate their books using an appropriate little sign to mark the occurrences of striking words, archaic or novel diction, brilliant flashes of style, adages, examples, and pithy remarks worth memorizing. He also suggested that every student and teacher keep a notebook organized by subject, so that whenever he lights on anything worth noting down, he may write it in the appropriate section. Transcribing the excerpts in longhand and rehearsing them regularly would help ensure that they remain fixed in the mind. The passages were to be viewed as kinds of flowers, which, plucked from the pages of books, could be preserved in the pages of memory. Erasmus, who as a schoolboy had memorized great swaths of classical literature, including the complete works of the poet Horace and the playwright Terence, was not recommending memorization for memorization's sake as a rote exercise for retaining facts. To him, memorizing was far more than a means of storage. It was the first step in a process of synthesis, a process that led to a deeper and more personal understanding of one's reading. He believed, as the classical historian Erica Rummel explains, that a person should digest or internalize what he learns and reflect, rather than slavishly produce the desirable qualities of the model author. Far from being a mechanical, mindless process, Erasmus's brand of memorization engaged the mind fully. It required, Rummel writes, creativeness and judgment. Erasmus's advice echoed that of the Roman Seneca, who also used a botanical metaphor to describe the essential role that memory plays in reading and in thinking. We should imitate bees, Seneca wrote, and we should keep in separate compartments whatever we have collected from our diverse reading, for things conserved separately keep better. Then, diligently applying all the resources of our native talent, we should mingle all the various nectars we have tasted and then turn them into a single sweet substance, in such a way that, even if it is apparent where it originated, it appears quite different from what it was in its original state. 
Memory for Seneca as for Erasmus was as much a crucible as a container. It was more than the sum of things remembered, it was something newly made, the essence of a unique self. Erasmus's recommendation that every reader keep a notebook of memorable quotations was widely and enthusiastically followed. Such notebooks, which came to be called commonplace books, or just commonplaces, became fixtures of Renaissance schooling. Every student kept one. By the 17th century, their use had spread beyond the schoolhouse. Commonplaces were viewed as necessary tools for the cultivation of an educated mind. In 1623, Francis Bacon observed, There can hardly be anything more useful, as a sound help for the memory, than a good and learned digest of commonplaces. By aiding the recording of written works in memory, he wrote, a well-maintained commonplace supplies matter to invention. Through the 18th century, according to American University linguistics professor Naomi Barron, a gentleman's commonplace book served both as a vehicle for and a chronicle of his intellectual development. The popularity of commonplace books ebbed as the pace of life quickened in the 19th century, and by the middle of the 20th century, memorization itself had begun to fall from favor. Progressive educators banished the practice from classrooms, dismissing it as a vestige of less enlightened time. What had long been viewed as a stimulus for personal insight and creativity came to be seen as a barrier to imagination, and then simply as a waste of mental energy. The introduction of a new storage and recording media throughout the last century audio tapes, videotapes, microfilm and microfiche, photocopiers, calculators, computer drives, greatly expanded the scope and availability of artificial memory. Committing information to one's own mind seemed ever less essential. The arrival of the limitless and easily searchable databanks of the internet brought a further shift, not just in the way we view memorization, but in the way we view memory itself. The net quickly came to be seen as a replacement for, rather than just a supplement to, personal memory. Today, people routinely talk about artificial memory as though it's indistinguishable from biological memory. Clive Thompson, the Wired writer, refers to the net as an outboard brain that is taking over the role previously played by inner memory. I've almost given up making an effort to remember anything, he says, because I can instantly retrieve the information online. He suggests that, by offloading data onto silicon, we free our own gray matter for more germanely human tasks, like brainstorming and daydreaming. David Brooks, the popular New York Times columnist, makes a similar point. I had thought that the magic of the information age was that it allowed us to know more, he writes. But then I realized, the magic of the information age is that it allows us to know less. It provides us with external cognitive servants, silicon memory systems, collaborative online filters, consumer preference algorithms, and networked knowledge. We can burden these servants and liberate ourselves. Peter Suderman, who writes for the American scene, argues that with our more or less permanent connections to the internet, it's no longer terribly efficient to use our brains to store information. Memory, he says, should now function like a simple index pointing us to places on the web where we can locate the information we need at the moment we need it. Why memorize the content of a single book when you could be using your brain to hold a quick guide to an entire library? Rather than memorize information, we now store it digitally and just remember what we stored. As the web teaches us to think like it does, he says, we'll end up keeping rather little deep knowledge in our own heads. Don Tapscott, the technology writer, puts it more bluntly. Now that we can look up anything with a click on Google, he says, memorizing long passages or historical facts is obsolete. Memorization is a waste of time. Our embrace of the idea that computer databases provide an effective and even superior substitute for personal memory is not particularly surprising. It culminates a century-long shift in the popular view of the mind. As the machines we use to store data have become more voluminous, flexible, and responsive, we've grown accustomed to the blurring of artificial and biological memory. But it's an extraordinary development nonetheless. The notion that memory can be outsourced, as Brooke puts it, would have been unthinkable at any earlier moment in our history. For the ancient Greeks, 
Memory was a goddess. Mnemosyne, mother of the muses. To Augustine, it was a vast and infinite profundity, a reflection of the power of God in man. The classical view remained the common view through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, up to, in fact, the close of the 19th century, when in an 1892 lecture before a group of teachers, William James declared that the art of remembering is the art of thinking. He was stating the obvious. Now his words seem old-fashioned. Not only has memory lost its divinity, it's well on its way to losing its humanness. Mnemosyne has become a machine. The shift in our view of memory is yet another manifestation of our acceptance of the metaphor that portrays the brain as a computer. If biological memory functions like a hard drive, storing bits of data in fixed locations and serving them up as inputs to the brain's calculations, then offloading that storage capacity to the web is not just possible, but as Thompson and Brooks argue, liberating. It provides us with a much more capacious memory, while clearing out space in our brains for more valuable and even more human computations. The analogy has a simplicity that makes it compelling, and it certainly seems more scientific than the suggestion that our memory is like a book of pressed flowers or the honey in a beehive's comb. But there's a problem with our new post-internet conception of human memory. It's wrong. After demonstrating in the early 1970s that synapses change with experience, Eric Kandel continued to probe the nervous system of the lowly sea slug for many years. The focus of his work shifted, though. He began to look beyond the neuronal triggers of simple reflex responses, such as the slug's withdrawal of its gill when touched, to the much more complicated question of how the brain stores information as memories. Kandel wanted, in particular, to shed light on one of the central and most perplexing riddles in neuroscience. How, exactly, does the brain transform fleeting short-term memories, such as the ones that enter and exit our working memory every waking moment, into the long-term memories that can last a lifetime? Neurologists and psychologists had known since the end of the 19th century that our brains hold more than one kind of memory. In 1885, the German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus conducted an exhausting series of experiments, using himself as the sole subject that involved memorizing 2,000 nonsense words. He discovered that his ability to retain a word in memory strengthened the more times he studied the word, and that it was much easier to memorize a half dozen words at a sitting than to memorize a dozen. He also found that the process of forgetting had two stages. Most of the words he studied disappeared from his memory very quickly, within an hour after he rehearsed them. But a smaller set stayed put much longer. They slipped away only gradually. The results of Ebbinghaus's test led William James to conclude, in 1980, that memories were of two kinds, primary memories, which evaporated from the mind soon after the event that inspired them, and secondary memories, which the brain could hold on to indefinitely. At around the same time, studies of boxers revealed that a concussive blow to the head could bring on retrograde amnesia, erasing all memories stored during the preceding few minutes or hours while leaving older memories intact. The same phenomena was noted in epileptics after they suffered seizures. Such observations implied that a memory, even a strong one, remains unstable for a brief period after it's formed. A certain amount of time seemed to be required for a primary or short-term memory to be transformed into a secondary or long-term one. That hypothesis was backed up by research conducted by two other German psychologists, Georg Müller and Alphonse Pilziker, in the late 1890s. In a variation on Ebbinghaus's experiments, they asked a group of people to memorize a list of nonsense words. A day later, they tested the group and found that the subjects had no problem recalling the list. The researchers then conducted the same experiment on another group of people, but this time they had the subjects study a second list of words immediately after learning the first list. In the next day's test, this group was unable to remember the initial set of words. Miller and Pilziker then conducted one last trial with another twist. The third group of subjects memorized the first list of words, and then, after a delay of two hours, were given the second list to study. This group, like the first, had little trouble remembering the initial words the next day. 
Müller and Pilsiker concluded that it takes an hour or so for memories to become fixed or consolidated in the brain. Short-term memories don't become long-term memories immediately, and the process of their consolidation is delicate. Any disruption, whether a jab to the head or a simple distraction, can sweep the nascent memories from the mind. Subsequent studies confirmed the existence of short-term and long-term forms of memory and provided further evidence of the importance of the consolidation phase during which the former are turned into the latter. In the 1960s, University of Pennsylvania neurologist Louis Flexner made a particularly intriguing discovery. After injecting mice with an antibiotic drug that prevented their cells from producing proteins, he found that the animals were unable to form long-term memories about how to avoid receiving a shock while in a maze, but could continue to store short-term ones. The implication was clear. Long-term memories are not just stronger forms of short-term memories. The two types of memory entail different biological processes. Storing long-term memories requires the synthesis of new proteins. Storing short-term memories does not. Inspired by the groundbreaking results of his earlier Ellipsia experiments, Kandel recruited a team of talented researchers, including physiological psychologists and cell biologists, to help him plumb the physical workings of both short-term and long-term memory. They began to meticulously trace the course of a sea slug's neuronal signals, one cell at a time, as the animal learned to adapt to outside stimuli, such as pokes and shocks to its body. They quickly confirmed what Ebbinghaus had observed. The more times an experience is repeated, the longer the memory of the experience lasts. Repetition encourages consolidation. Repetition encourages consolidation. Okay, I read that twice, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, when they examined the physiological effects of repetition on individual neurons and synapses, they discovered something amazing. Not only did the concentration of neurotransmitters in synapses change, altering the strength of the existing connections between neurons, but the neurons grew entirely new synaptic terminals. The formation of long-term memories, in other words, involves not only biochemical changes, but anatomical ones. That explained, Kandel realized, why memory consolidation requires new proteins. Proteins play an essential role in producing structural changes in cells. The anatomical alterations in the slug's relatively simple memory circuits were extensive. In one case, the researchers found that before a long-term memory was consolidated, a particular sensory neuron had some 1,300 synaptic connections to about 25 other neurons. Only about 40% of those connections were active, in other words, sending signals through the production of neurotransmitters. After the long-term memory had been formed, the number of synaptic connections had more than doubled to about 2,700, and the proportion that were active had increased from 40% to 60%. The new synapses remained in place as long as the memory persisted. When the memory was allowed to fade by discontinuing the repetition of the experience, the number of synapses eventually dropped to about 1,500. The fact that even after a memory is forgotten, the number of synapses remains a bit higher than it had been helps explain why it's easier to learn something a second time. Through the new round of Aplysia experiments, Kandel wrote in his 2006 memoir, In Search of Memory, we could see for the first time that the number of synapses in the brain is not fixed. It changes with learning. Moreover, long-term memory persists for as long as the anatomical changes are maintained. The research also revealed the basic physiological difference between the two types of memory. Short-term memory produces a change in the function of the synapse, strengthening or weakening pre-existing connections. Long-term memory requires anatomical changes. Kandel's findings fit seamlessly with the discoveries being made about neuroplasticity by Michael Merzenich and others. Further experiments soon made it clear that the biochemical and structural changes involved in memory consolidation are not limited to slugs. They also take place in the brains of other animals, including primates. Kandel and his colleagues had unlocked some of the secrets of memory at the cellular level. Now they wanted to go deeper to the molecular processes within the cells. The researchers were, as Kandel later put it, entering completely uncharted territory. They looked first at the molecular changes that occur in synapses as short-term memories are formed. They found that the process involves much more than just the transmission of neurotransmitter, 
glutamate in this case, from one neuron to another. Other types of cells, called interneurons, are also involved. The interneurons produce the neurotransmitter serotonin, which fine-tunes the synaptic connection, modulating the amount of glutamate released into the synapse. Working with the biochemists James Schwartz and Paul Greengard, Kendall discovered that the fine-tuning occurs through a series of molecular signals. The serotonin released by the interneuron binds to a receptor on the membrane of the presynaptic neuron, the neuron carrying the electric pulse, which starts a chemical reaction that leads the neuron to produce a molecule called cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP in turn activates a protein called kinase A, a catalytic enzyme that spurs the cell to release more glutamate into the synapse, thereby strengthening the synaptic connection, prolonging the electrical activity in the linked neurons, and enabling the brain to maintain the short-term memory for seconds or minutes. The next challenge facing Kandel was to figure out how such briefly held short-term memories could be transformed into much more permanent long-term memories. What was the molecular basis of the consolidation process? Answering that question would require him to enter the realm of genetics. In 1983, the prestigious and well-financed Howard Hughes Medical Institute asked Kandel, together with Schwartz and the Columbia University neuroscientist Richard Axel, to head a research group in molecular cognition based at Columbia. The group soon succeeded in harvesting neurons from larval aplipsia and using them to grow as a tissue culture in the laboratory, a basic neural circuit incorporating a presynaptic neuron, a postsynaptic neuron, and the synapse between them. To mimic the action of the modulating interneurons, the scientists injected serotonin into the culture. A single squirt of serotonin replicating a single learning experience triggered, as expected, a release of glutamate, producing the brief strengthening of the synapse that is characteristic of short-term memory. Five separate squirts of serotonin in contrast strengthened the existing synapse for days and also spurred the formation of new synaptic terminals, changes characteristic of long-term memory. What happens after repeated injections of serotonin is that the enzyme kinase A, along with another enzyme called MAP, moves from the neuron's outer cytoplasm into its nucleus. There, kinase A activates a protein called CREB-1, which in turn switches on a set of genes that synthesize the proteins the neuron needs to grow new synaptic terminals. At the same time, MAP activates another protein, CREB-2, which switches off a set of genes that inhibit the growth of new terminals. Through a complex chemical process of cellular marking, the resulting synaptic changes are concentrated at particular regions on the surface of the neuron and perpetuated over long periods of time. It is through this elaborate process involving extensive chemical and genetic signals and changes that synapses become able to hold memories over the course of days or even years. The growth and maintenance of new synaptic terminals, writes Kendall, makes memory persist. The process also says something important about how, thanks to the plasticity of our brains, our experiences continually shape our behavior and identity. The fact that a gene must be switched on to form long-term memory shows clearly that genes are not simply determinants of behavior, but are also responsive to environmental stimulation such as learning. The mental life of a sea slug, it seems safe to say, is not particularly exciting. The memory circuits that Kandel and his team studied were simple ones. They involved the storage of what psychologists call implicit memories, the unconscious memories of past experiences that are recalled automatically in carrying out a reflexive action or rehearsing a learned skill. A slug calls on implicit memories when retracting its gill. A person draws on them when dribbling a basketball or riding a bike. As Kendall explains, an implicit memory is recalled directly through performance, without any conscious effort or even awareness that we are drawing on memory. When we talk about our memories, we're usually referring to explicit ones, the recollections of people, events, facts, ideas, feelings, and impressions that we're able to summon into the working memory of our conscious mind. Explicit memory encompasses everything that we say we remember about the past. Kandel refers to explicit memory as complex memory, and for good reason. The long-term storage of explicit memories 
involves all the biochemical and molecular processes of synaptic consolidation that play out in sorting and storing implicit memories. But it also requires a second form of consolidation called system consolidation, which involves concerted interactions among far-flung areas of the brain. Scientists have only recently begun to document the workings of system consolidation, and many of their findings remain tentative. What's clear, though, is that the consolidation of explicit memories involves a long and involved conversation between the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. A small, ancient part of the brain, the hippocampus lies beneath the cortex, folded deep within the medial temporal lobes. As well as being the seat of our navigational sense, it's where London cabbies store their mental maps of the city's roads, the hippocampus plays an important role in the formation and management of explicit memories. Much of the credit for the discovery of the hippocampus's connection with memory storage lies with an unfortunate man named Henry Malaysen. Born in 1926, Malaysen was stricken with epilepsy after suffering a severe head injury in his youth. During his adult years, he experienced increasingly debilitating grand mal seizures. The source of his affliction was eventually traced to the area of his hippocampus, and in 1953, doctors removed most of the hippocampus as well as other parts of the medial temporal lobes. The surgery cured Malaysen's epilepsy but it had an extraordinarily strange effect on his memory. His implicit memories remained intact, as did older explicit memories. He could remember the events of his childhood in great detail, but many of his more recent explicit memories, some dating back years before the surgery, had vanished. He was no longer able to store new explicit memories. Events slipped from his mind moments after they had happened. Malaysen's experience, meticulously documented by the English psychologist Brenda Milner, suggested that the hippocampus is essential to the consolidation of new explicit memories, but that after a time, many of those memories come to exist independently of the hippocampus. Extensive experiments over the last five decades have helped untangle this conundrum. The memory of an experience seemed to be stored initially not only in the cortical regions that record the experience, the auditory cortex from a moment of a sound, the visual cortex for a memory of a sight, and so forth, but also in the hippocampus. The hippocampus provides an ideal holding place for new memories because its synapses are able to change very quickly. Over the course of a few days, through a still mysterious signaling process, the hippocampus helps stabilize the memory in the cortex, beginning its transformation from a short-term memory into a long-term one. Eventually, once the memory is fully consolidated, it appears to be erased from the hippocampus. The cortex becomes its sole holding place. Fully transferring an explicit memory from the hippocampus to the cortex is a gradual process that can take many years. That's why so many of Malaysen's memories disappeared, along with his hippocampus. The hippocampus seems to act as something like an orchestra conductor in directing the symphony of our conscious memory. Beyond its involvement in fixing particular memories in the cortex, it is thought to play an important role in weaving together the various contemporaneous memories, visual, spatial, auditory, tactile, emotional, that are stored separately in the brain, but that coalesce to form a single, seamless recollection of an event. Neuroscientists also theorize that the hippocampus helps link new memories with older ones, forming the rich mesh of neuronal connections that give memory its flexibility and depth. Many of the connections between memories are likely forged when we're asleep and the hippocampus is relieved of some of its other cognitive chores. As the psychiatrist Daniel Siegel explains in his book, The Developing Mind, though filled with a combination of seemingly random activations, aspects of the day's experiences and elements from the distant past, dreams may be the fundamental way in which the mind consolidates the myriad of explicit recollections into a coherent set of representations for permanent consolidated memory. When our sleep suffers, studies show too, so does our memory. Much remains to be learned about the workings of explicit and even implicit memory, and much of what we know now will be revised and refined through future research. But the growing body of evidence makes clear that the memory inside our heads is the product of an extraordinarily complex natural process 
that is at every instant exquisitely tuned to the unique environment in which each of us lives and the unique pattern of experiences that each of us goes through. The old botanical metaphors for memory, with their emphasis on continual, indeterminate organic growth, are, it turns out, remarkably apt. In fact, they seem to be more fitting than our new, fashionably high-tech metaphors, which equate biological memory with the precisely defined bits of digital data stored in databases and processed by computer chips. Governed by highly variable biological signals, chemical, electrical, and genetic, every aspect of human memory, the way it's formed, maintained, connected, recalled, has almost infinite gradations. Computer memory exist as a simple binary bit, ones and zeros, that are processed through fixed circuits, which can either be open or closed, but nothing in between. Kobe Rosenblum, who heads the Department of Neurobiology and Ethology at the University of Haifa in Israel, has, like Eric Kandel, done extensive research on memory consolidation. One of the salient lessons to emerge from his work is how different biological memory is from computer memory. The process of long-term memory creation in the human brain, he says, is one of the incredible processes which is so clearly different than artificial brains like those in a computer. While an artificial brain absorbs information and immediately saves it in his memory, the human brain continues to process information long after it is received, and the quality of memories depend on how the information is processed. Biological memory is alive. Computer memory is not. Those who celebrate the outsourcing of memory to the web have been misled by a metaphor. They overlook the fundamentally organic nature of biological memory. What gives real memory its richness and its character, not to mention its mystery and fragility, is its contingency. It exists in time, changing as the body changes. Indeed, the very act of recalling a memory appears to restart the entire process of consolidation, including the generation of proteins to form new synaptic terminals. Once we bring an explicit long-term memory back into working memory, it becomes a short-term memory again. When we reconsolidate it, it gains a new set of connections, a new context. As Joseph Ledoux explains, the brain that does the remembering is not the brain that formed the initial memory. In order for the old memory to make sense in the current brain, the memory has to be updated. Biological memory is in a perpetual state of renewal. The memory stored in a computer, by contrast, takes the form of distinct and static bits. You can move the bits from one storage drive to another as many times as you like, and they will always remain precisely as they were. The proponents of the outsourcing idea also confuse working memory with long-term memory. When a person fails to consolidate a fact, an idea, or an experience in long-term memory, he's not freeing up space in his brain for other functions. In contrast to working memory with its constrained capacity, long-term memory expands and contracts with almost unlimited elasticity thanks to the brain's ability to grow and prune synaptic terminals and continually adjust the strength of synaptic connections. Unlike a computer, writes Nelson Cowan, an expert on memory who teaches at the University of Missouri, the normal human brain never reaches a point at which experiences can no longer be committed to memory. The brain cannot be full. Says Torkel Klinberg, the amount of information that can be stored in long-term memory is virtually boundless. Evidence suggests, moreover, that as we build up our personal store of memories, our minds become sharper. The very act of remembering, explains clinical psychologist Sheila Crowell in The Neurobiology of Learning, appears to modify the brain in a way that can make it easier to learn ideas and skills in the future. We don't constrain our mental powers when we store new long-term memories. We strengthen them. With each expansion of our memory comes an enlargement of our intelligence. The web provides a convenient and compelling supplement to personal memory, but when we start using the web as a substitute for personal memory, bypassing the inner processes of consolidation, we risk emptying our minds of their riches. In the 1970s, when schools began allowing students to use portable calculators, many parents objected. They worried that a reliance on the machines would weaken their children's grasp of mathematical concepts. The fears subsequent studies showed were largely unwarranted. 
No longer forced to spend a lot of time on routine calculations, many students gained a deeper understanding of the principles underlying their exercises. Today, the story of the calculator is often used to support the argument that our growing dependence on online databases is benign, even liberating. In freeing us from the work of remembering, it said, the web allows us to devote more time to creative thought. But the parallel is flawed. The pocket calculator relieved the pressure on our working memory, letting us deploy that critical short-term store for more abstract reasoning. As the experience of math students has shown, the calculator made it easier for the brain to transfer ideas from working memory to long-term memory and encode them in conceptual schemas that are so important to building knowledge. The web has a very different effect. It places more pressure on our working memory, not only diverting resources from our higher reasoning faculties, but obstructing the consolidation of long-term memories and the development of schemas. The calculator, a powerful but highly specialized tool, turned out to be an aid to memory. The web is a technology of forgetfulness. What determines what we remember and what we forget? The key to memory consolidation is attentiveness. Storing explicit memories, and equally important, forming connections between them, requires strong mental concentration amplified by repetition or by intense intellectual or emotional engagement. The sharper the attention, the sharper the memory. For a memory to persist, writes Kendall, the incoming information must be thoroughly and deeply processed. This is accomplished by attending to the information and associating it meaningfully and systematically with knowledge already well established in memory. If we are unable to attend to the information in our working memory, the information lasts only as long as the neurons that hold it maintain their electric charge. A few seconds at best. Then it's gone, leaving little or no trace in the mind. Attention may seem ethereal, a ghost inside the head as the developmental psychologist Bruce McCandless says, but it's a genuine physical state, and it produces material effects throughout the brain. Recent experiments with mice indicate that the act of paying attention to an idea or an experience sets off a chain reaction that crisscrosses the brain. Conscious attention begins in the frontal lobes of the cerebral cortex with the imposition of top-down executive control over the mind's focus. The establishment of attention leads the neurons of the cortex to send signals to neurons in the midbrain that produce the powerful neurotransmitter dopamine. The axons of these neurons reach all the way into the hippocampus, providing a distribution channel for the neurotransmitter. Once the dopamine is funneled into the synapses of the hippocampus, it jumpstarts the consolidation of explicit memory, probably by activating genes that spur the synthesis of new proteins. The influx of competing messages that we receive whenever we go online not only overloads our working memory, it makes it much harder for our frontal lobes to concentrate our attention on any one thing. The process of memory consolidation can't even get started. And thanks once again to the plasticity of our neuronal pathways, the more we use the web, the more we train our brain to be distracted, to process information very quickly and very efficiently, but without sustained attention. That helps explain why many of us find it hard to concentrate even when we're away from our computers. Our brains become adept at forgetting, inept at remembering. Our growing dependence on the web's information stores may in fact be the product of a self-perpetuating, self-amplifying loop. As our use of the web makes it harder for us to lock information into our biological memory, we're forced to rely more and more on the net's capacious and easily searchable artificial memory, even if it makes us shallower thinkers. The changes in our brains happen automatically, outside the narrow compass of our consciousness, but that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility for the choices we make. One thing that sets us apart from other animals is the command we have been granted over our attention. Learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think, said the novelist David Foster Wallace in a commencement address at Kenyon College in 2005. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. To give up that control is to be left with the constant gnawing sense to having had and lost some infinite thing. 
a mentally troubled man. He would hang himself two and a half years after the speech. Wallace knew with special urgency the stakes involved in how we choose, or fail to choose, to focus our mind. We cede control over our attention at our own peril. Everything that neuroscientists have discovered about the cellular and molecular workings of the human brain underscores that point. Socrates may have been mistaken about the effects of writing, but he was wise to warn us against taking memory's treasures for granted. His prophecy of a tool that would implant forgetfulness in the mind, providing a recipe not for memory but for reminder, has gained new currency with the coming of the web. The prediction may turn out to have been merely premature, not wrong. Of all of the sacrifices we make when we devote ourselves to the internet as our universal medium, the greatest is likely to be the wealth of connections within our own minds. It's true that the web itself is a network of connections, but the hyperlinks that associate bits of online data are nothing like the synapses in our brain. The web's links are just addresses, simple software tags that direct a browser to load another discrete page of information. They have none of the organic richness or sensitivity of our synapses. The brain's connections, writes Aries Schulman, don't merely provide access to a memory. They in many ways constitute memories. The web's connections are not our connections, and no matter how many hours we spend searching and surfing, they will never become our connections. When we outsource our memory to a machine, we also outsource a very important part of our intellect, and even our identity. William James, in concluding his 1892 lecture on memory, said, The connecting is the thinking. To which could be added, The connecting is the self. I project the history of the future, wrote Walt Whitman in one of the opening verses of Leaves of Grass. It has long been known that the culture a person is brought up in influences the content and character of that person's memory. People born into societies that celebrate individual achievement, like the United States, tend, for example, to be able to remember events from earlier in their lives than do people raised in societies that stress communal achievement, such as Korea. Psychologists and anthropologists are now discovering that, as Whitman intuited, the influence goes both ways. Personal memory shapes and sustains the collective memory that underpins culture. What's stored in the individual mind, events, facts, concepts, skills, is more than the representation of distinctive personhood that constitutes the self, writes the anthropologist Pascal Boyer. It's also the crux of cultural transmission. Each of us carries and projects the history of the future. Culture is sustained in our synapses. The offloading of memory to external databanks doesn't just threaten the depth and distinctiveness of the self. It threatens the depth and distinctiveness of the culture we all share. In a recent essay, the playwright Richard Foreman eloquently described what's at stake. I come from a tradition of Western culture, he wrote, in which the ideal, my ideal, was the complex, dense, and cathedral-like structure of the highly educated and articulate personality. A man or woman who carried inside themselves a personally constructed and unique version of the entire heritage of the West. But now, he continued, I see within us all, myself included, the replacement of complex inner density with a new kind of self evolving under the pressure of information overload and the technology of the instantly available. As we are drained of our inner repertory of dense cultural inheritance, Foreman concluded, we risk turning into pancake people, spread wide and thin, as we connect with that vast network of information accessed by the mere touch of a button. Culture is more than the aggregate of what Google describes as the world's information. It's more than what can be reduced to binary code and uploaded onto the net. To remain vital, culture must be renewed in the minds of the members of every generation. Outsource memory and culture withers.